Hello again. Welcome to Discovering the Real God. We are continuing the study on divorce and remarriage. And um, if you remember last time I was uh, read out the portion of scripture Ephesians 5 21 to 33 and talking about wives love your husbands and uh, sorry <laughs> husbands love your wives and wives obey your husbands and so on and so forth and it was comparing that love uh, between man and wife as Christ loves the church and of course <laughs> the return of Christ loving us is that we should obey Christ uh, do we always no so that scripture encompasses what God was saying in the beginning. God brought all the creatures of the earth to Adam so that he could name them. But out of the animals there was found no one, not, not, not a suitable helpmate. God took part of Adam to create Eve. Uh, then they become one flesh. So that in the eyes of God, husband and wife are one. As I've explained before, we are two spirits but one flesh. How then, if a couple are of the Christian faith, can a man mistreat his wife? How then can a wife despise her husband? It is surely... The same root cause that took the first man and his wife from a life of peace and perfection to a life under curse. The curse of toil, sweat and pain. The reason is it can only be sin. There's no way around it. Marriage is the ideal situation for a man and woman to be together. Children are a blessing to that union. Although we can look at other facets of life that God ordained for mankind, God wanted us to respect each other and not to do harm. The ideal of God was soon shipwrecked <laughs> because Cain rose up and murdered his brother Abel. It wasn't so long, in fact, after that, that God regretted that he had created man at all. And he vowed then to blot mankind out of the picture. But there was one man who found favour in God's eyes. That was Noah. Noah gave us all a fresh start. Or God gave us all a fresh start through Noah. But even then, the first thing that the righteous man did when he had been saved from the flood was to cultivate a vineyard and get drunk. And he was laying naked in his tent and his son Ham. Well, we don't know what he did. He, he either took a good look at his naked father, uh, uncovering his nakedness, or he com committed some vile act upon his father. We just don't know. You, you, you can... Uh, I say it's left to your imagination, but who wants to imagine that? Uh, whatever it was, it was certainly sinful in nature. Um, it certainly wasn't just a peep through the tent flap. When Noah awoke from his wine, he knew the thing which his youngest son had done to him. He exclaimed, Cursed be Canaan. He shall be the servant of servants to his brethren. Now coming under a curse suggests that it was a bit more than just a peep. But nevertheless... We've got back into sin very quickly. My point is that men and women have striven with God in disobedience and rebellion right from the start. Under the new covenant, the Lord said that previously the Holy Spirit was with us, but now under the new dispensation he would be in us. And he would write the law on the tablets of our heart. 
one would think that that would be comparably easy for us to walk then in the path of righteousness. I think I've shown in my books and other writings that living under the new covenant is much more difficult than living under the old law because it's our choice all the time and we have to do it through love and we find that difficult. We find it difficult to love our brothers and sisters. We find it difficult to follow the command of Christ, a new commandment. The Bible shows us that even with the Holy Spirit, we started to display the spirit of independence, that we would separate ourselves from a God. Uh, Ananias and Sapphira uh, committing their act of cheating on the Holy Spirit. Let's not suppose that they were the only ones to transgress. It was just an example given in the Bible. Uh, it was in the lifetime of the Apostle John that the Lord sent his messages to the church to both commend and to condemn. No matter how harshly God may speak to us to correct and chastise us, He's always showing a way forward in him. See what I'm saying? No matter how bad you've become or what you've done, he's always looking for us to repent and to move on with him. That's the point. And that's something to get hold of here. This is what we're going towards. I mean, do you suppose that if Ananias and Sapphira had fall onto the knees and, and said, God forgive me, I did lie to the Holy Spirit. Do you think that they'd have fall drop dead? No. If they'd have repented there and then, God would have accepted that repentance. But no, they carried on with the whole charade till it brought death. Well, let's look at the Bible again. We've already established that God hates divorce Yet, the Lord, as I've observed many times before, the Lord doesn't play by his own rule book. When the time had come for the exiled Jews to return from their captivity from Babylon uh, and they begin rebuilding the temple of the, the Lord, the walls of, and the walls of Jerusalem, sorry, it was discovered that a good number of them, uh, of the men, including priests, and Levites had entered into marriage with foreign women. So, afterwards, officials came to me and said, the Israelites and the priests and Levites have not separated themselves from the peoples of the land, but have committed abominations of the Canaanites, Hittites, Perizzites, Jebusites, Ammonites, Moabites, Egyptians and Amorites. Ezra 9 1. After Ezra finished his intercession, it became apparent how the Israelites could put themselves right with God and to continue rebuilding the work of the holy city. They were to put away their wives, they were to divorce their wives. And including the children, the children weren't gathered up and said, oh, well, we'll, f you know, the children are innocent. No, they were all put away. How then should we look at that situation? The marriages weren't sanctified by God. It was nothing to God. He, he, his purpose was paramount in rebuilding Jerusalem. They had to get right, and their wives and children had to go. How could that be? Nevertheless, it happened, and God moved on with his people. Many children have been put together to death as part of God's strategy to rid the holy land of heathen sinners. My, God, my point is that God's not got a rule book. He's not got a rule book. He said, 
in Samuel 1, 15, 3. Now go and smite the Amalekah. Um, sorry, go and smite Amalek and utterly destroyed all they have. Do not spare them, but kill both men, women, infant, suckling, ox, sheep, camel and donkey. On the one hand we have Abraham, the father of faith, whose son Ishmael, the son of a concubine, was evicted from his home, given no status amongst God's people. And on the other hand we have the sons of Jacob, born to his wives, and the sons born of concubines that became the head of the twelve tribes of Israel. No comparison, is there? Ishmael, who was the son of a concubine, was also blessed. But there are no rules with God. God made the rules for himself, for, for us and not for himself. You know, I get tired of Christians who say God wouldn't do that. You tell them something that's happened in your life and they say, oh no, that, that couldn't have been God. God wouldn't do that. Let's blame the devil for that. They fail to see that whatever Satan does is by God's sanction. Anyway, I mustn't get sidetracked with that. The fact is, that in the book of Ezra, those who had married heathen wives repented of what they had done and wanted God to wipe the slate clean. When we have made the wrong decision, we suffer for it. We will want to put things right. There are often casualties other than ourselves. That's the point. In this new dispensation, we should have the mind of Christ. We should be walking in the Spirit. We should lay down our lives in a way that determines that we no longer have any control whatsoever over our own lives. But control is given to the hands of our Heavenly Father. What happens in a marriage if one of the partners decides and desires to follow the Lord and the other begins to backslide? Where does God stand? If one partner wants with all their heart to follow the plan of God and the other has no interest in the things of God. They did have, but they have backslidden and gone away from God. Their choice. Not because of cruelty, not because of anything, but they've desired the things of the world more than the things of God. They prefer the world. What does God do then? Let's say that the backslidden partner despises their mate so much they demand a divorce. Now don't forget, these days a woman can divorce a man as well as a man can divorce a woman. Taking this scenario to its hypothetical conclusion, a divorce takes place. The backslidden partner goes their way, the way of the world. What does God then say to their loyal subject who has trusted in him through this terrible, terrible period in their lives and wants with all their heart to continue and wait upon God in hope. What does God do? There's another scenario that I've also witnessed a number of times in my walk with the Lord. One partner in the marriage becomes entangled with a third person. Suddenly states that God has told them to leave their wife and to marry another woman or man, depending. The marriage ends in divorce. One of the partners follows their desires to its conclusion. And it's clear that lust 
has played a part in this scenario. Once again, through sin, a person has been made a victim. It's my belief that even if one has become a victim of circumstance that has led to a divorce being forced upon them against one's will, then it is incumbent upon that person to repent that they played a part in the breakup of the marriage. It takes two to tango, as they say, but they have contributed to the breakup of their marriage in some way. There's never one person that's to blame. No one's never totally innocent. In the first scenario, we must ask what caused the partner to backslide. In the second scenario, what caused the partner to turn their head away and look to another, either for sexual comfort or any other comfort. There's always blame. But if we ever want to move on with God, there's all, always got to be sorrow and repentance before forgiveness can take place. There has to be forgiveness of the partner. There has to be forgiveness of anyone involved. There has to be forgiveness. There has to be repentance. Let's just think of the Bible. And how God saw those who had transgressed. But in whose heart God saw something of value. Because they wanted to repent. Jesus chose to speak to the woman at the well. A serial adulteress. He used her to bring the gospel to Samaria. Jesus didn't say, oh no, you've been divorced, you can't serve God. No. No. She was the way into Samaria. Jesus forgave the woman caught in adultery, the very act of adultery. He just said, go and sin no more. Have a life. A full life. Peter the Apostle denied Christ three times. Denied him three times after living with him. Walking with the Son of God. But denied him. Yet, he'd become a great apostle, a great servant of God, who gave his life in the end for his saviour. Paul the apostle conspired against and persecuted the church, yet he was responsible for writing the, the bigger part of the New Testament. Jacob, the twister, the supplanter became Israel. David, the adulterer and conspirator to murder, was the man after God's own heart. Yet, according to the church, the religious church, if you've been divorced, you cannot be a minister. Shame on you, that's what I say. Shame on you. And I don't care how high you, up you are in the church hierarchy, or you're the leader of a denomination, or what you are, if you have this rule in your denomination, shame on you. If you're married and never suffered the pain of divorce, then thank God. You've never been subjected to the most hideous of experiences. Work hard to remain in a loving, giving relationship before the Lord and in accordance with his word. If you've ever experienced the death of a loved one, then that is akin to the pain of divorce. The difference is, in my view, that with death one can draw a line and move on through that grieving process that God has given us. With divorce, the person of your love is still present, but can never be yours again. Those who have found themselves in this awful situation will know how awful it is.
but God forgives so must we according to his commandment has God ever said to a repentant heart I can never use you no he hasn't for if you forgive people their trespasses their reckless and willful sins leave, leaving them and letting them go and giving up resentment your heavenly father will also forgive you but if you do not forgive others their trespasses and their reckless willful sins leaving them letting them go and giving up resentment neither will your heavenly father forgive your trespasses Matthew 6 14 15 I give you a new commandment that you should love one another just as I have loved you so you too should love one another by this shall all men know that you are my disciples if you love one another and keep on showing love amongst yourselves there is forgiveness mistakes have been made but there is forgiveness we can move on we must truly truly repent even if we were the innocent or so-called innocent party of this hideous thing called divorce we must repent of the part we played the contribution we made to the breakdown with tears with repentance and move on in God God can use you again there is forgiveness I hope that's helped some people that have been through this awful thing called divorce and separation. God is there and what anyone ever says to you, God can use you. God never, ever, ever in my experience has cast anyone aside who genuinely wants to move on in God there is a way forward I know wonderful wonderful teachers and ministers all over the world that have suffered the pain of divorce yet they are serving God in the most wonderful wonderful way it is possible and can be for you God bless you we'll see you again for another series, whatever that is, in discovering the real God, we'll see you very soon. Thank you. Bye-bye.